mind and in my heart. For the past few days, uh, I'm going to share something with you about myself that might not be uh, easy to swallow, but hey, you know me, I'm very transparent. I like sharing with you my journey as a Christian as I continue to grow <clears throat> in Jesus. But I want to start by reading from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is the verse that I want to focus on. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Uh, Friday night, I'm sitting at home, just playing a game with some friends. And I start going through my Facebook account and I start looking at some of the comments and posts that I have made all the way back starting in 2006. <clears throat> and my jaw dropped to the ground because of, I could not believe the things that I used to post there, you know? <laughs> I, was, I was in a very, very dark place about seven years ago to the point that I had made the decision in my life. And I remember things were not working out in school, so I left. I didn't have a job, so I used to spend every day lying on the sofa in my apartment thinking, how am I gonna do it? And I came up with many different ways on how to do it. But every time, the Lord put in my heart the same reason for not doing it. And I'm glad that I didn't. Because when I look at myself, where I was seven years ago than where I was two and a half years ago when I made the decision, God, I want you to dictate the way I live. And where I am now, it's completely 180. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, you know, some things didn't work out the way I wanted them to work out, but I'm here now. And I'm as happy as I can be. I've grown a lot. Amen. The Lord has given me revelation yes. about many things that have helped me become a better man, a better friend, a better son, and a better person overall. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, he is calling. He has been calling me for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that I did. And that brings me to the second thing that I want to share with you. Um, this is a letter that my mother's pastor wrote last weekend. Uh, last year, they had made the decision of doing this 40 days of prayer and fasting in my hometown back in, and I'm going to say it the way I should say, Puerto Rico. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and it was very successful. So this year, they're doing it again. They started on Monday. And uh, he shared, or my mother shared on her Facebook page, the letter that he wrote and posted on his blog, and I was reading it and I was like, wow, you know, it was very powerful. So I decided to share this with you. So it took me about two hours yesterday to translate the whole thing, uh, but I want to read it to you. And it says, open letter to my brothers in the ministry. This coming Monday, August 24th, 2015, God willing, we will start gathering again from 5 to 6 a.m. for the next 40 days, in which we will be seeking closeness to God in humility, and submission taking into account the events that beset our city, our country, the whole world. Recently, a fellow pastor brought to my attention something that shook me deeply and made me think about how big of a responsibility it is, this type of calling. He reminded
reminded me that although the church is accustomed to pray constantly for the petition for this petition or that petition, both personal or as a collective, when we receive news that there is a patient in intensive care, quotations, we abandon momentarily all the petitions at hand to concentrate fully on that particular situation before us. He also expressed his opinion regarding what he thinks is the worst case of intensive care that is attacking our country today. Immediately, I was shocked and I saw God's heart to confirm that this calling for fasting and prayer, as well as the specific prayer needs we had agreed to focus on during these 40 days, were stemming from his heart and not ours. The Lord reminded me of a recent, recent situation in which we spent the night in the emergency room with my, with, what, sorry, with my 91 year old father. On that day, my father was laid on a gurney in one of the many hallways of the overcrowded hospital along with many others going through a wide variety of situations, all very serious and delicate. It was then when I saw clearly how the Lord was showing me that there are many intensive care patients in our city and our country these days. Mm -hmm. Every one of us can think that it is our individual situation the most important one, when in reality we all need the same intensity of intercession from the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. We have then several alternatives before us. We can continue to claim special treatment for our own intensive care patient, or we can look around and realize that Puerto Rico has become an emergency room full of all those patients that need the same attention. You can apply that to any place. Mm -hmm. We can embody the spirit of Thomas and say that we will not continue to pray and fast like the church because we have not seen concrete evidence of things that have come to pass. Or we can realize that the first miracle from last year's fasting was that hundreds of brothers and sisters from countless of denominations came together every day with a humbling and repentant attitude before God, on pretensions and without personal requests. We cannot look ourselves in our world and refuse to set aside differences, interpretations, opinions, or feuds that all they do is open the door for the enemy of the spirit. Mm -hmm. The entire world is in crisis. God has called us and we must listen and answer that calling. This is not about any of us, but about him. Amen. He is asking us to come together so we can overcome what lurks around us as a body. God is not calling the church in Ponce, nor the church in Puerto Rico, but the church of the entire world to repentance and obedience, to set aside programs or agendas so we can focus on what is in his heart. Mm -hmm. yes. Do we know what's on God's mind? No. So it's necessary that we seek him and we go to him in spirit and in truth so that his grace can be manifested over those that have decided to follow mm -hmm. him and be obedient. Things are bad in Ponce, so that's true, but there's so much more going on in the world for us to ignore it. Financial systems are collapsing, including China's and the United States. Puerto Rico is not exempt from suffering the consequences. Global climate change cannot be denied anymore. 2015 has been deemed the hottest year, and July the hottest month since global climate has been recorded. Persecution against the church is rampant around the world, especially in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. In that sense, in Ponce and Puerto Rico, we are still blessed, although the situation continues to change daily. The rise of radical Islamic movements and other terrorists threaten the security and peace of the entire world, bringing their war style to the doors of Europe, America, Asia, and Africa. We have been witnesses to the systematic and methodical destruction of the principles of the traditional family on all levels. Abortions, infants, graceful children, adolescents, education, abuse, bullying, destroyed marriages, dysfunctional homes, same-sex marriage, etc. We must avoid focusing on our own priorities and focus on priorities God wants to establish for this time, not only here, but also throughout the world. We will only accomplish that by coming to his presence, united and brave towards the battle we face, for the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh of the flesh, but we have but have divine power to destroy the strongholds. Second Corinthians 10 4. Mark 9, 28, 29 says, And we had, when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why can we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding fills your spirit today and every day. Blessings, Carlos Camacho. I do believe that the call that the Lord has made for this church is being answered, and that's why all these partnerships are forming throughout the city. So we are seeing the beginning of this plan that He has, and we're going to see the fruit of everything that's happening right now. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So
saw it happen. unless it's previously revealed by the Spirit beforehand. Uh, we just go where, where he wants us to go. And with that situation, we'll also be focusing on the naturally 911 situation for our land and for Israel. Um, <clears throat> the next generation is raising up. Um, even the, the girls that are here on Wednesday nights and stuff that are, that are uh, coming that want to start a youth group. 12 to 17, I think they said it was, they wanted uh, three of the young ladies are coming that are 12 and 13 years old to come in and pray on Wednesday nights and talk about things. And <clears throat> so the heart is there, and I don't want to disturb it. I want to help it grow, so I'm going to be praying for that situation also. Um, uh, Jamie's been working excellent with the uh, younger children and stuff, doing an awesome job, but there's a gap in there <clears throat> that needs to be taken care of. Those are the ones that are going to be going to college in a few years and stuff like that and are going into the world of influence. So they need to be honed and sharpened and, and guided um, <clears throat> into that situation. So, yeah, we'll definitely be praying about that situation also. So. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right, we're going to speak the word this morning. Will you not, not revive us again? May your people and your sing you. signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created and functions. And I forbid it not functioning this body in the name of Jesus. 
and Don, would you mind taking the offering? No, Don. <laughs> With a D. <laughs> I'm giving Grandpa Juan a break. <laughs> uh, can you say the blessing, please? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today. We just pray that the service will be what everyone needs it to be. That's the kind of God you are. Yes, Lord. You to touch every one of us in the need that we have at the same time. Lord, we give you honor and glory. We ask you to bless this offering. And again, Lord, may we have a great service. Y'all ready to praise the Lord, church? That's two of you. Y'all ready to praise the Lord? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, after yesterday's wedding, country theme, I can't see Roberto on a cowboy hat. I don't know if they got, I don't know if they got a Puerto, Puerto Rican twang. <laughs> How do you say y'all in Puerto Rican? <laughs> Picks flying? No picks flying? Not Bobby Pins? There's no translation for it. No translation for y'all. <laughs> Burn over me. First one. Fire. 
fuego, más fuego. of our praise you are worthy Lord your face outshines the brightest sun Jesus you're glorious you are so glorious with eyes that blaze like a burning fire Jesus you're glorious you are so glorious, King of glory, have your glory, King of glory, have your glory. Have your way in this place, Lord, have your way in this place, Lord. Touch our lives with your presence, Lord. We need your presence, Lord. Your face outshines the brightest sun. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. King of glory, have your glory. King of glory, have your glory. Have your way. What a sound Jesus, you're powerful Jesus, so powerful And in your hand you hold the stars You are so powerful You are so powerful King of Oh 
Have your glory, Lord. 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 It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Ooh, I can't stop praising your name. Lift your name, you Lord of Word. Lord, praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of the Lord, you are worthy,
alone are worthy, Lord, of all praise. We worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. It's all about you.
Man, it was crazy fog coming in through Altoona. And, but this will encourage you. The golf course was full. For, you know, it was incredible. I almost stopped because I thought this would be my day to play the game. I might have a, you know, a chance at least, but it's insane out here. Appreciate all of you, though, uh, getting here in spite of the, the fog and all the other things that seem to get in our way when it comes to Sunday. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's great to be here, and I appreciate all of you being here and uh, those that were unable to be here, which are quite a few, and I think they're thinking that it's next week, <laughs> Labor Day weekend, so they're probably all out of town. If you have a Bible or you don't want to look up on the screen, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Roberto, I'm going to read uh, from 2 Samuel 6, verses 12 through 23. I got a bunch of scripture this morning. Maybe I'll get through all of it. Maybe I won't. But uh, Sally and I were talking yesterday, and she said she'd rather just, I just talk, but... <laughs> Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, but then I'm subject to critiques. So I can only depend on her to say that because she has to go home with me. And, but uh, I'd rather stay with the scripture that way. If there are questions or people don't have to just take my opinion, you can go back and search the scriptures and see if what I'm saying is true. Amen? Because God would rather reveal to you through his word than any other way. Amen? This is... The S word, praise the Lord, the sword of the spirit. And yes. it's the only offensive weapon that we have, uh, according to Ephesians. Uh, it's the weapon that we use against the enemy. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yes. It's our words. Yes. We are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So when our testimony agrees with what the blood of the lamb provides, we can expect to get those results. Right. So if Jesus provided healing... And all we do is talk about how sick we are. We're not likely going to get the benefits, amen, of his healing. Praise God. And likewise for anything else. It's just like salvation alone. Uh, the scripture says that we become saved by believing what Jesus said and then confessing it. Yes. So we just, I mean, it's that simple. It isn't a complicated uh, thing. If it was, I wouldn't be here, amen, and uh, neither would most of the rest of us, right? It isn't something intellectual. It's just something that we believe and you just receive it by faith. Praise the Lord. So I want to talk to you this morning about the enemies of freedom. And, uh, you know, that's a, it's an issue for everybody in the natural world. But more importantly, it's an issue for us as Christians, as believers. Because there's so many bogus teachings about what Christianity is and what you have to do to be a Christian. And, and God knows, anybody that really knows me knows I am not a religious person. I like to think of myself as being spiritual only because I'm born again, but it doesn't make me weird or, you know what I mean? I'm just not a religious kind of person that's running around thumping the Bible all the time and, and you know, threatening people with hell and, and all the rest of it because I never see Jesus doing that. And if we are supposed to be the body of Christ, then I guess we ought to be more like him. And he was pretty laid back. He was pr not really too uptight about uh, sinning and sinners. I'm not saying he endorsed it or he was for it, but he, what the thing was, he was trying to get people to understand that he came to deliver us from that, yes. amen, not to give us a way of doing it ourselves. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's, let's look at some scripture here. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Now, Obed-Edom was actually a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. Uh, you, you can read in another, a couple of places in Scripture, in Chronicles and also in Psalms, where he became a gatekeeper at the house of the Lord. He couldn't participate in the uh, inner workings of the church uh, of, of that day, the synagogues or the, uh, the temple. But he could, be, he's, uh, he could be a gatekeeper. He could be there at the gate when people entered in, so he could still be in the presence of, or close to the presence of the Lord. And... Uh, there's a, there's a scripture that David even speaks referring to that where he said, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than to be wealthy and rich and have all the fame and everything else. So this is the Obed-Edom. And so they, the ark had been there, 
because uh, the enemies of Israel, uh, one of the ites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gugagites, or somebody, some one of those ites had taken it. And because they all had some really bad issues as a result of taking it, they put it on a cart and sent it away, and it ended up at Obed-Edom's place. And he kept it there, and for that time that it was at Obed-Edom's, his whole house prospered. Everybody was blessed. Everything was good. Everything was happening. So uh, David, finding out that it was there, originally went there, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a little back up here just for your information. But originally David went there, and they took it, and they took the ark to, they were on their way to Israel with it, but they were doing it the wrong way. It was one thing for the Gentiles or the unbelievers to put it on a cart and haul it, but Israel had to have a, it had to be carried on staffs by the priests. And on the way to uh, Jerusalem, they rocked the boat, so to speak, and one of, them, one of the men who were nearby reaches up to steady the ark so it won't fall off the shoulders of the priests, and he's killed instantly. Well, there you, there, there you go. Praise the Lord. <laughs> So there's something to be said about religious people. Yeah. Amen. So they immediately they take it back because they're all freaked out and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They didn't, hadn't gone back to the scriptures to see that it was supposed to be carried on, a, uh, on the poles by the uh, priest. They were carrying it on a car, so they took it back. Now this David finds out Obed-Edom's getting blessed. All kinds of good stuff's happening at his house, so he's going back to get the ark. Finds out that the priest was supposed to carry it on stage, and that's what he does. And it was so that when they had... That bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. He sacrificed oxen and fatlings. So every six steps of this carrying the ark, they would stop and make a sacrifice. All right? And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David... Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in, his heart, in her heart. In other words, she thought, look at this idiot. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, and in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And I like this part. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women, as to the men, so women, men, everybody got this, to everyone, a, a loaf of bread, big chunk of beef, and a bottle of wine. Woo. Can you say amen? Yeah. amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. And the people departed everyone to his house to eat the bread, eat the meat, and drink the wine. Hallelujah. And David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, she's being facetious, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the famed fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michael, I was before the Lord which chose me before your father, before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight, and of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, and of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child yeah. under the day of her death. Yeah. Right. Now, you know, all of us go through this. So when we're worshiping, and there's no, you know, right and wrong way, so to speak, of worshiping. If you're one who likes to raise your hands, because the Bible says lifting holy hands to the Lord, or you get a little giddy up, you know, and you're body, you know, when the music's playing and all that stuff, that's cool, that's fine, but that's, that's not what this is about. What this is about is freedom. Yes. The freedom to just, I love you, Jesus, and don't have to be embarrassed about it or, you know, freaking out. Well, the problem is here, this wife of David despised it, and because of that, she never bore any children. In other words, she, was never, she wasn't fruitful. She didn't produce anything, amen, out of her life as a result of this. Now, the ark... If, if you remember, the ark has a mercy seat on top of the two angels or, or you know, wings are extended one to another. And that's where the blood in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple, that's where the blood was applied on the Day of Atonement. And so that blood would go over the mercy seat. The mercy seat actually covered what was in the ark and what was in the ark were the Ten Commandments. So the mercy seat in the, in the New Testament is called the Elasterion, which is the covering of God or the mercy seat of God. So that... Those angels, that, that covering represented Jesus. 
It was a representation of Christ who comes between us and the law. Yes. And uh, that's why David was excited. He understood yes. this. This is the thing that's going to get between God's anger yes. and us because we're all sinners. We're all failing all the time. And so getting this back to Israel was exciting to him because it meant forgiveness. It meant mercy. It meant grace because it was yes. going to get between God and their failure to keep the law. Amen? So they were excited, as anybody would be, understanding that. All right, now, Roberto, let's go to Luke chapter 19, and uh, we'll read verses 37 through 40. Luke 19, 37 through 40. And this is kind of a, a New Testament parallel to what we just read under the Old Covenant. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. They were talking about all the miracles that Jesus had done, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto them, Master, rebuke your disciples, because the disciples are getting crazy. They're doing what David had been doing, only now it's Jesus that's coming into town instead of the ark, right? Yeah. And so they're getting the parallel there. They're, they're understanding, here he is. This is the fulfillment of that ark. And he's coming to town on a donkey. He's riding on the back of a donkey, and they're just getting nuts. And the Pharisees see it, and they're saying, Jesus, tell these guys to calm down. They, they shouldn't be treating you like this. They shouldn't be worshiping you like this. You know, you, they shouldn't be doing that. They should, just, they should be, you know, just re under control here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that, if these should not, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Something is going to praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? All of creation declares the glory of God, the reality of God. So something's going to praise God. If we don't, hallelujah, I'm looking for rocks to step up. Praise the Lord. That's what, that's what the Lord was talking about here. So what we're seeing in this, uh, these scriptures is the battle between law and grace, between religion and relationship with God. Amen? Between bondage and, between, and freedom. Hallelujah. So let's look, let's look at Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. And this is going to be the theme. This is what we're talking about this morning uh, in all of these scriptures. So in Matthew 23, verses 1 and 2, Jesus speaks to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Well, we know Moses' seat. The law came by Moses and grace and truth by Jesus Christ. So the, the Pharisees had seated themselves, and this is the important part, they seated themselves in the chair of Moses. In other words, as those who were going to enforce the law on the people. They were Moses being the giver and the enforcer of the law. They set themselves in that position. Amen? All right, so look at John chapter 5 and verse 45. And we're saying this because when you think of religion, Christian religion, uh, in general, or in particular for, for our case, that's what we see as much as we see anything else is rules and regulations that you have to keep in order for God to love you, in order for God to forgive you, in order for God to be merciful to you. Right. And it has nothing to do with the law. Right. But we have, as pastors and as preachers, and even as Christians in general, have seated ourselves in this place where we're saying, now you can't do that, and, and you're really a bad person because you've done that, or you're, you're going to go to hell because you haven't done this, right? Yeah. Amen. So don't think that I will accuse you. This is Jesus speaking now. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save it. And they're aggravated because they figure if he's really going to represent God because of their misunderstanding about God, they think he ought to be coming there with a hammer to beat everybody up that's not doing everything they're supposed to be doing, right? But Jesus said, don't think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. In other words, he's saying, you're putting your confidence in the law, so you better be able to keep the law, yeah. or you're going to be in big trouble. Right. Because if you're going to keep the law, you've got to keep every single bit of the law. You can't err in any place, or you're guilty of all of it. Yes. So you say, well, I, I don't, uh, you know, I've never murdered anybody. Have you ever hated anybody? Yeah. Have you ever wished somebody <laughs> would have a problem, you know? <laughs> Jesus said that's the same thing. So, well, I don't commit adultery. No, but do a little eyeballing every once in a while. You know, you see you know, somebody go, guy, girl, whatever. And, well, that's attractive. And yeah. Jesus said, that's it. Yeah. You're guilty. Exactly. He raised the law, the bar of the law, to a point yeah. where they understood nobody can keep this. 
so that they would quit trying to keep it and come to him. Amen. So they would trust him. Amen? Amen? That's the whole point of Christianity. It isn't about how good you are in keeping rules and regulations. It's about whether or not you can believe that Jesus has already done all this for you. And then you can rest in the finished work of the cross. Amen. That's the message. That's the good news of the gospel that we have missed in our effort of trying to make people better externally. We've destroyed the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to minister to them internally. Yes. Hallelujah. Because none of us are going to get out of here without screwing up. Right. I mean, as long as we're in the body, we're going to be messing around. We're going to have problems. We're going to fail. Sometimes, and we, you know, we say, well, it was, I, it was an unintentional sin. That's baloney. You, you can't sin without knowing it. Everybody says, well, there's, you know, there's premeditated sin, and then there's just accidental sin. It's all premeditated. You can't do anything without thinking about it. You may not think a long time about it, but you still have to think about it in order to do it. So just forget about this. It isn't about, well, I accidentally woke up one morning with somebody else's wife. I don't know how it happened. I just, oh, here I was. No, that or anything else, it takes some thinking. Hallelujah. So don't think I'm going to accuse you. There's already one that accuses you. That's the law. Okay? All right. Praise the Lord. The scribes and the Pharisees had seated themselves in Moses' chair. Amen? God didn't put them there. He didn't put them in that position. They did. So when somebody comes and says, you know, the Lord told me that this thing that you're doing, he's going to get you for. No. Believe me, God didn't tell them or send them to tell you. They just took some authority and thought, you know, I'll help the Lord out here. Yeah. And they're misconstruing what God has said, and they're deliberately, or at least ignorantly, if not deliberately, misrepresenting God and causing people to think that God is this horrible thing, when in fact Jesus is the exact representation of God. Yeah. It's just that we got this problem because under the old covenant you see people getting killed. You say, well, God's a murderer then. No, listen, let me, here's the deal. The law was under the old covenant. Yeah. Right. And I, I mentioned this, I think, Wednesday night. Those of you that had kids, when they were little, you gave them rules. Yes. You had to give them rules or they'd have killed each other or themselves. Yes. Right? You had to say, if you go out in the street, I'm going to beat your rear end or I'm going to put you in a corner yeah. or I'm going to do something to punish you so that you'll learn don't go out in the street or you'll get hurt. Just one example. It could be, you know, multiple things. Well, that's because they were little kids. They were tiny. They were young. Well, now, the reason for doing that, or you say, share your toys. No kid wants to share their toys. They only want to share when somebody else has the toy. The moment they get it, and they forget all about sharing. So we tell them, you have to learn to share. You can't be selfish. You can't be self-centered. You've got to do this. And if you don't, you don't get to play with the toys. Right? Well, that's the law. That's what the law was for. It says as long as we were children, we were under schoolmasters, taskmasters. We were under the law. Why? Because we weren't mature enough to just be led by the Spirit. So kids don't have a, you know, an inner compass, if you will, to kind of guide them and help them to make decisions. They have to have somebody to influence them. That's the reason for the law. These people were spiritually dead. They were disconnected from God because of Adam. Yeah. There was no atonement. There was nothing to put them back into position. And so they got rules. Right. Now, they never kept the rules any more than our kids do. Right. <laughs> right? But they still had to have them. They had to have something to control them until they reached an age where they could think a little bit reasonably. So that at a certain age, you, you don't have to tell them to share your toys most of the time. You know, I mean, they grow up, they learn not to play in the street, yeah. they don't run around out in the freeway. Why? Because they've just learned there's consequences to that behavior. Not God's going to kill them, right. but you'll get run over by a truck. Yeah. It's not God driving the truck, it's just consequences for behavior. Sure. Amen? Yeah. So that's the reason for all of this, okay? <laughs> so, look at Matthew chapter 23, and we'll, let's read verses 5 through 7 this time. So the law was never meant to perfect us. It was meant to protect us and to bring us to Jesus who could then yes. perfect us. Because we are perfect in him. Yes. Amen. Yes. Even though we still screw up, yes. in the eyes of God, we're perfect in Christ. So, but all their works they do 
to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Phylacteries were the leather uh, thongs-like things that they wrapped around them, and in there there was a little uh, conical thing that had scripture in it. And they put, they put them, even to this day, the Hasidic Jews and the Orthodox Jews will still do this, and you see it on their forehead and on their forearms. And it's representing that they are in constantly in contact with the Word of God. But they weren't content with this. They made broad their phylacteries. In other words, they really made a big extreme issue of this and enlarged the border of their garments where there were tassels, and they would just make a bigger deal out of that so everybody would see it. And lo they loved the uppermost rooms at a feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Amen? So here's Jesus didn't, uh, Jesus didn't tell them uh, that this was wrong. He didn't rebuke the Pharisees for wearing the phylacteries or the tassels or the, the, the hems of, of their garment, but he, he did rebuke them for being, making them more prominent than they would normally be. Right. In other words, to draw attention to themselves, forcing people to notice how spiritual I am. Yeah. Right. Now, some of us know yeah. how that works in religion. You know, you dress a certain way, you look a certain way, and it's like, look at me, yeah. I'm really religious. Yeah. I'm really spiritual, and you're not. I mean, we, you got people that they won't, they won't go to swimming pools, they won't go to a movie, they, they won't wear shorts, they, they won't even wear short sleeve shirts. And I mean, you know, there's all kinds of things going on. I'm not trying to be hateful, I'm just saying, all that does is draw attention to the person. It doesn't just point anybody to Jesus. No. It's just about, look at me. I'm really something. And that's what these guys were doing. And it really aggravated the Lord. Amen? And so to the Pharisees and, and even to the Pharisees of today, image is everything. Yeah. You know? Amen? It's, it's still this self-centered kind of attitude about, you know, I'm really holy and you're nothing. You better, if you need to hear something from God, you better come talk to me because right. you're never going to find out. You know, you're just, you're just too messed up. But I got all the answers, amen? So that's another warning here that Jesus has given against legalism. Right. The right clothes, the right places, long public prayers, amen? Fasting. Nothing wrong with fasting unless you start bragging about it. Right. Yeah. Amen? I, when, when we were in Texas, I used to put the sign up on the church all the time. And I, every once in a while, I'd get in trouble because I'd go a little beyond my pay grade my authority. And I remember one time putting up, and this is a huge sign right on Interstate 10, so everybody going through Interstate 10 is going to see this. Uh -huh. I remember putting up, the Lord loves a cheerful giver till they brag about it. Right. Ooh, the phone was ringing off the hook at the <laughs> pastor's study. Amen. It wasn't but about four or five hours, and I was out there taking the sign down and putting up something a little more appropriate. But that's kind of the attitude that some people have. You know, they'll give, but only if everybody sees me giving, yeah. you know. Or, uh, you know, I'll pray, but only if I get to be the leader of the prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm going to drag this thing on forever and <laughs> so on and so forth. Or we'll sit around and look all, you know, like we're dying uh, because we fasted one meal. <laughs> I can't today because I'm fasting. <laughs> Have been for 23 minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> Amen. And anybody that's ever fasted knows you can you pick the one food you hate. Yeah. And you'll eat it in a heartbeat. And 30 minutes after you've gone on a fast, you'll say, I'll, I'll eat that hot dog. Just give it here, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So Jesus was just exposing these people because of their behavior, which was contrary to the kingdom of God. Now, you can read this, and I mean, we are, I don't know why we don't get it, because even in the scripture, he says to these people that prostitutes, tax collectors, publicans, are going to enter the kingdom before you will. Yeah. And he's telling this to the most religious people yeah. of their day. Yeah. And he's saying these people that you say are, have no hope of ever experiencing a relationship with God, and he said, I'm telling you, you have missed it so much because those people are getting in before you are. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Jesus, it, it was like the Lord was like the little kid. Everybody read that book uh, when you were little, The Emperor's New Clothes? 
And so they're all rigged up in their, you know, religious garments and everything. And Jesus is saying, you know what? They're naked. They don't have any clothes on. Everybody else is saying, man, look at how spiritual and how religious. And he's saying, no, their garments are filthy rags. God robes us in righteousness. He does it. We don't do it. He just declares our righteousness because of Jesus. Amen? So, okay, back to Matthew 23. Let's go verses 8 through 10. Because this is supposed to set us free. You know, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But I got to tell you, most of religion, including Christianity, is more burdens and more shame and more guilt than it is about freedom. And it's not compatible with the scripture. It's not in the context that Jesus taught it. Amen. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master. Now, this is Jesus talking to these same people. And he's saying, you don't want to be called the big shot because there's only one master, and that's Christ. And all ye are brothers. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. So Jesus is wanting to take away this clergy mystique, this religious kind of thinking, amen, and that was his goal. That was his purpose. That's what he was doing. And how we can miss this, I don't know. I mean, I just can't yeah. get it. I, I don't understand. Amen. Verse 11. Go to the next verse here. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And that was totally lost on these Pharisees. Totally lost on these religious leaders. Right. And unfortunately, it still is. Praise the Lord. All right, Matthew 23, verse 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So because they seated themselves in the seat of Moses or the position of the law, they were rejecting Jesus by whom comes grace and truth. Yeah. So they were denying people the only access to God that there really is. When they, when they reject Jesus, they're rejecting the grace of God. They're re rejecting the free gift of God saying, your sins, I won't hold them against you. Your iniquities, they don't exist anymore as far as I'm concerned because Jesus bore all of your sin, yes. past, present, future, yes. premeditated and otherwise. Yes. He took them all. And if you don't let people come to that reality, you're not getting in and you're not letting them in. Right. So you become what he called a twofold son of hell. Right. That's pretty powerful talk yeah. coming from the Lord. Amen. And he's just saying you won't go in and you're not going to let them go in because you're rejecting me. You're rejecting grace and truth. Right. Right. Amen. Right. All right. Matthew 23 verse 4. You see, there's people everywhere that are just like I was for 35 years or more that think God is demanding something that they know personally they can't ever do. They can't ever fulfill the demand of the law because they're too flawed. They're too messed up. They've got too many issues. They've got too many whatevers. So they always are playing around the, the, the outward edges of of this relationship, but never getting into it because they don't think God will accept them. They think God is going to punish. If I get very close, I'm going to get the backhand. Yeah. It isn't going to be an embrace. It's going to be a slap upside the head. So I don't want to get that close to him. I mean, I'll, I'll believe that he exists, but I don't want to get into some kind of a relationship where I'll be intimate enough to where he can do any damage to me. He doesn't want to do that. He says their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Period. That's what God said. Yes. That's why David was a man after God's own heart, because David had a mindset of a new covenant kind of person. Even though he lived under the law, he knew that God wasn't demanding sacrifices. God was wanting to give mercy. Yes. You won't find anybody under the law that was any more dysfunctional than David. An adulterer, a murderer, a, you know, the whole family was a chaotic mess. Yeah. And yet, God loved him. Yes. And he said, I'll trust God's mercy yes. in spite of 
my failures. And God put him right in the line of genealogy for Jesus Christ to be born. Along with a prostitute, a couple of other pretty uh, dysfunctional people. And Jesus chose them to be great-grandparents in his genealogy. Praise God. I'd say most of us are in pretty good company when it comes to what God wants to use in this world. Amen? Amen. Because they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So they give you all kinds of rules and demands and, and reasons why you've got to do this and you've got to do that, but they won't do one single thing to help them. They just put more fear, more guilt, more shame, more condemnation, but they don't do one single thing to make them understand that God loves them and that God wants them to be free. Yes. Praise the Lord. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. This, I think, and let me back up just for a moment because a lot of times we freak ourselves out over some scriptures. But, you know, that's why the scripture says there are those that will call the name of Jesus. They'll do things in the name of Jesus. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's right. Why? Because they never came to him in faith just according to grace. They were just saying, Jesus said do this. Jesus says do that. And they they never entered in. And they didn't allow anybody else to enter in. It's not an indictment against us as believers. It's against false teachers. It's against people that are trying to do what these people did. And that's put more and more burdens on people and give them no means of escape. And make God look as though he hates everybody. And it's just a crapshoot. Maybe you'll get lucky, and he'll let this. this that's Islam. Yeah, right. If you do enough good things, you'll get the 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 seventy-seven year old virgin. <laughs> is that right? Oh, seventy-seven virgins. I'm sorry. The closer I get to seventy-seven, oh, the better it sounds. You know what the heck? Praise the Lord. But anyhow, John nine one through three. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the work of God may be manifest in him. God wants to do a miracle in everybody. Amen. And, it's, and, and, and the sins that we see are not what causes our problems. It's our inability to trust God, to come to God. Problems we got. Everybody's got. In this world, you'll have tribulations yeah. we're, because we're human. Yes. We'll make bad choices. We'll do stupid stuff. We'll, we'll do things that we wish we hadn't done. But God doesn't condemn us for it. Right. He's forgiven us. Yes. He looked at Jesus, and Jesus lived perfectly. Jesus didn't do the stuff I did. And so when God looks at me, he says, yes. perfect in Christ. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. It's impossible to understand. It's the great, it's the good news. It's yes. almost too good to comprehend. But it is what the Bible teaches. Yes. And that gives you a freedom. That gives you uh, the ability to say, praise the Lord, you know, and to just live your life happy, even when you're screwed up, even when you are screwed up. You can still know that you're accepted by God. You know, there's something great about uh, love where, you know, like with children especially, husbands and wives, we have issues where we kind of, it isn't always as reciprocal as we'd like it to be, you know, we irritate each other. But with little kids, especially grandkids, I think that's probably the, the purest way of looking at it. It's, it's love that doesn't put any demand on the other. You don't ask, they don't have to do anything. Those little things there don't have to do anything for me to love them. I just love them. Even when they're bad, even when they're naughty, I still love them. Yeah. I just send them home. <laughs> I don't have to deal with it. But you know what I'm saying? I, they, they can't do anything for me. I just love them. Yeah. And that's part of it. And that's the image that God wants us to have. He's like a he- your heavenly father. He said, if fathers give good gifts to their kids, how much more does your heavenly father, who's, who is not, doesn't get up in a bad mood some days, who isn't tired after a long day's work and a little bit short and, and didn't just, you know, do something stupid. He, he loves us and he doesn't demand anything in return except that we just believe him. Yeah. We just trust him. Amen. How many, how many times have you ever had kids on the counter or this thing and jump, jump, jump? It's cool when they do it because you know that they trust you, but the, usually it takes them a little while. They're kind of going, I don't know, is he one of these 
Charlie Brown guy's going to yank the football just before I. But when they, once they do it, it's like, man, this is good. Because yeah. you know they trust you. Yeah. You know they, you have their confidence. And that's what God is saying. Go ahead, jump. I got you. I'll catch you. You know, I'm not going to drop you. So as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, say, Master, who did the sin? And Jesus said, it wasn't, this isn't about, he's not blind because he sinned. He's blind because we live in a fallen world and people have issues. People get born blind. We know there are birth defects. There's all kinds of issues that go on in the world. It's not God. But God wants to do something miraculous in that person's life. And that's what Jesus is trying to express here. So he, in, in reference to this, what Jesus does is he uses a real-life example to expose these legalists. Because the legalists believe everything that happens to somebody is a result of sin. Yeah. Get in a car wreck. Well, you had it coming. You're a sinner. Go to jail. It's God. He got you. No, the law got you for breaking the law. But it wasn't God. It was just the consequences of behavior. And Jesus said, it wasn't sin that caused this. And I'm going to prove it to you. So he goes on in John chapter 9, uh, verse 6. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. All right, skip to verse uh, uh, 14 and 15. So Jesus, this blind guy, he comes, he spits in the mud, makes a little thing and puts it on his eyes. And for those of you like me that are a low CD, I'd still be blind. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyway, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisee also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, he put clay on my eyes, I washed, and now I can see. Amen. Right? Okay, let's skip all the way down to verse 34, and uh, we'll read verses 34 through 41. 34 through 41. So they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Now this is the Pharisees talking to this guy that Jesus healed, because he won't stop saying Jesus did it. And uh, so they said, you're a, you're a sinner. You were born in sin, and you're still a sinner. They're saying he was born in sin because that's why he was blind. That's what Jesus tried to correct their thinking in the very beginning of this. And he says, now you're going to teach us? You got you that was born a sinner and were born blind because of your sin? How he managed to do that before he was born, I don't know, but that was their thinking. And, and he says, you're going to try to teach us now, you, you sinner? And so they cast him out of the synagogue, out of the temple, I should say. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he, had, when he found the guy, he says unto him, do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and he said, who is he, Lord, so that I can believe on him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it's he that's talking with you right now. Amen. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they would see not might see, mm -hmm. and that they which see might be made blind. Yes. 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 Praise the Lord. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and they said unto him, Are we blind also? It's kind of this arrogant, like, you're going to tell us we're blind too, huh? Yeah. And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now because you're saying that we do see, therefore your sin remaineth. Mm -hmm. Because they claim to know and wouldn't share the truth, right. he says you're still blind. Right. It's the blind guy mm -hmm. who could see yeah. because he was willing to come to me yeah. even in his condition. And he probably believed that he was a sinner too and that's why he was blind because that was the, yeah. that was the, you know, the cultural belief at that time. And yet he still trusted that Jesus would do something for him in spite of his sinful nature or sinful condition. Amen? You see, here's the difference. And I don't know if you can see it here, but the, the difference in how Jesus spoke to this guy that he heals, the sinner, right. the one who had been identified as this sinner, right? right? And versus how he speaks to these Pharisees who are supposed to be the great religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Amen? Matthew chapter 23 and then verses uh, 25 through 28. So if you're thinking, man, I'm just a horrible sinner. 
Jesus says to you, I'm he, and I'm here for you. Yes. To heal you, to deliver you, right. to accept you. But here's what he has to say to the religious leaders. Yeah. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Yeah. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, yeah. so that the outside of them yes. may yes. be clean also. Yeah. Nice. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited graves or tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Exactly. God is not so concerned about this outward exactly. stuff. Exactly. We think he is because that's what we've always been taught. Yeah. Yeah. But the truth is, God looks at the heart. Yes. Yes. We look at people that are not in church today or that are not part of a congregation or whatever, right. and we say, oh, man, what a mess. You know, they're just so stupid, the things that they do, the lifestyles, the behavior, and everything else. And we don't know but what inside that person, they have already said, Jesus, if you're real, yeah. do something for me. And I promise you, if they have, he has. Yeah. That's the way I did it. I was laying on the floor in a house in Houston and just said, God, if you're real, you got to do something. Because I'm not going to live this way any longer. I was trying to commit suicide with alcohol and drugs and you, I couldn't get a gun back in those days, <laughs> praise the Lord. But uh, you know, I was just committing suicide little by little. Yeah. Now did I become a perfect, you know, saint and sanctified person? No. But Jesus did change something in my heart that yes. gave me a hope that there was something more yes. than that. And I didn't have to live you know, you know, you all know me. I mean, I've told you. I'm, I, I, it isn't like I became a, you know, a monk or something, and never touched another drop of alcohol, or never did any, or said a, you know, foul word, or that's just not the case. But there was a hope that comes yes. with knowing that God accepts you in all of your weaknesses, yes. in your humanity. Yes. He knows we are human, yes. and He doesn't hold that against us. He became a human and lived a perfect life so that our humanity doesn't hold us back from God. He says, I love you with all of your messes, with all of your stuff, and I'm not going to shame you or put you on a guilt trip. I'm calling you because I love you. Right? Praise the Lord. Where was it? Uh, Matthew 23, uh, verses 25 through 28. Okay. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto white and sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are full of dead men's bones. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity, which is sin. Amen? So here's what they did. They trivialized what a relationship with God was all about. And they reduced it to keeping a rigid set of rules and uh, regulations while they were ignoring the condition of their own hearts. They were separated from God and didn't even know it. Right. They thought if we just keep giving more rules, you know, God's going to love us even more. And the fact was, they weren't connected to God at all and didn't know it. Right. The guy who knew he was disconnected immediately gets connected. But those who are claiming to be connected aren't. Right. Praise the Lord. Amen. God wants mercy, yes. not religious sacrifice. Right. He wants love not legalism. Amen? Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. I told you I had a lot of scriptures, but this way you can't, you can't argue with me, you can argue with God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. I told you about this last week when I went to the bar. With a buddy of mine had a few beers. He had quite a few. And uh, as I said, because I was buying but I know that, 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 that causes concern to some people. Yeah. I mean, after all, you're a pastor. You don't know me very well, or you wouldn't say that. Right. The only difference between this and you is that this, I'm just doing this today. It's, my, it's what I do. 
doesn't make me any holier than anybody else. I, I probably fail more than a lot of you. And, you know, if you're going to use that criteria as failure or success. But Jesus yes. is sitting here with sinners and prostitutes, and they're having a, a brunch or something, and they're drinking. And we know David already told us under the Old Testament, under the law, where it was even more rigid, he says, here's what I'm going to do because Jesus has come to town or because God has shown up the ark. We've got the ark here. I'm giving everybody bread. I'm giving everybody meat and a bottle of wine. Have a good time. Let's party. Every Jewish festival is involved with wine and drinking and partying. They go on to a wedding. A, a Jewish wedding can last like 30 days. That's why Jesus, that's why they ran out of wine. It wasn't like they had two bottles of uh, Mogan David or something and they just ran short. They had gallons of wine, but they were drinking so much that they ran out. And it was going to be a humiliation for the host or the master of the feast, the guy who's throwing the party, if he didn't have enough to keep giving it. So Jesus didn't make grape juice. He made the good wine. He made the best wine. It says you've saved the best for last. Now, argue with somebody else about that because it's wine. It's not grape juice. It's not something unfermented. It is what they drank. Now, you don't, I don't know about you, but I couldn't drink much grape juice. Not for very long. But I could probably drink quite a bit of wine if it was all okay and, you know, it was kosher, legal, and everything's all right. Especially once you get to having a good time. Right? But grape juice only, you know, you can only handle so much of that. It's like orange juice, yeah. a drink, and that's it. Otherwise, you're going to have other issues. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So just say it. Amen. It came to pass, as Jesus said at meet in the house, that behold, the publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why is your master eating with these sinners? But when Jesus heard them, he said unto them, They that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. Exactly. Who else... I don't need to go eat and drink with some preacher. The guy that needs to know that God loves him is the guy you need to be sitting with and talking to and telling him, you know what, we're not going to hell for this. God loves you. He wants to do something for you. He's already done something for you. If you can just accept it, if you can just receive it. Now, it's a lot easier. Because, see, there's a lot of people that won't even talk to me if they know that I'm a pastor. Because they immediately assume they're going to be judged that they got to measure up, they can't slip up a word here or say a thing there or whatever. It's just, it's just so misleading. It's uncomfortable for me. Yeah. I mean, I don't want people feeling all weird, you know, just because. So I don't tell them. I mean, I don't tell people unless they ask me, you know, what do you do? And then it's, I don't know, Pastor. <laughs> what? Well, I'm a, a pastor church down here. <laughs> Because I know I'll lose their attention immediately. I'll lose credibility with them when I try to tell them that God loves them because of, well, he's just, that's his job. Right. He's got to do this. Yeah. Or they say, like this old friend of mine, come and have a beer with me. It's my birthday. I was like, are you kidding? I'm a pastor. I'm not going near that. You know? Like, it'll defile me. Yeah. Yeah. No, more was done in that two beers that I drank with him yeah. than probably he'd experienced for 20 years yes. in terms of really knowing about God's love or, or, or that God's acceptance for people isn't based on performance. Right. Now, everybody else in there might have thought, what a hypocrite. I think he's a preacher. But see, it's because of these preconceived ideas we have about ministry about what God's really trying to do. And in fact, Jesus, and that's the point, how, how do we miss this? Jesus is going right to him. He's saying, come, I'm going to go home and eat with you today. Yeah. Yeah. He did. I, we're going we're gonna to party because God loves you. I want you to know that God cares. Yeah. And the prostitutes are washing his feet and the publicans are pouring the wine and everybody's going, my God, the, the, the Pharisees are flipping out, pulling their hair out and saying, he's, he's what, what in the world is this guy doing? He's drinking, he's eating with Pharisees or with, with publicans and sinners and he's got prostitutes there because they totally misunderstood God. Yes. And Jesus comes right back at him. Amen. He says, when Jesus, thank you. When Jesus heard that, he said unto them, 
they that be whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. So go and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice because I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. People that know they got a problem, I've always said this, are the easiest ones to deal with. It's the ones who think they got it all together, but just you can't reach them. Praise God. Okay, where, where were we? That was 13, 14, 15. Have we had, had, did we get to 15 yet? No, that was 15. Okay, keep going. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Uh, 14 and 15. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but the disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. All right, uh, drop down to verse 34. We'll, we'll read 34 through 41. Well, then don't do that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Bear with me now. I'm working on a healing for 67. It's called short-term memory loss. I told you there were consequences, but it didn't come from God. So praise the Lord. Matthew 10 through 13, we did that? Is that where we were? No, okay. Matthew 10. Matthew 9, 10 through 13. We did that? How about 16 and 17? Okay, I knew I'd get one sooner or later, but just call out numbers. Praise the Lord. And no man puts a piece of new cloth into an old garment. For that which is put in, in to fill it takes from the garment, and rent is made worse. So if you ladies, anybody that sews, knows that if you take a brand new piece of material and you try to patch a garment that is old, when you start washing it, they shrink at a different rate, and they pull apart. This is not about clothes. It's about mixing law and grace. Jesus is using a parable and an analogy, amen, that you can't take old and new and make them work together. It goes on then to say, neither do men put new wine into old wine bottles. Wine skins is, is how it's actually translated because the old wine skins will split because the new wine is still fermenting. It's still active. It's still working. The yeast in it and so on and so forth. So it's still expanding. And the old wine skin won't hold it. It'll split apart. He's still, he's not talking about wine and wine skins. He's talking about taking the law, the old covenant, and trying to force it into the new covenant. You lose both. You lose the reason for the law in the first place, which was to bring you to Jesus, and then you lose Jesus because you're still enforcing the law. And you can't accept grace based on your effort or your performance because it's no longer grace. It's either a free gift from God or it's you earning it. It is no longer grace, is what Jesus said. It becomes, or Paul, he says it then becomes law. Yeah. And now you're going to be held accountable to the law again. So you either embrace the free gift of God's grace and his favor and forgiveness, or you're fighting a losing battle. You're going to be struggling for the rest of your life. Yeah. Amen? All right, praise the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34, and, and we'll read 11 and 12. Unless somebody can give me a better one. Praise the Lord. <laughs> For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will be both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Now skip to uh, 14 through 16. It's amazing. The human mind is just outrageous. <laughs> you get up in the morning, snaps into gear, and it works perfectly until you get to work. Yeah. And it just stops. Praise yeah. the Lord. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountain of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. Yes. I will seek that which was lost 
and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. This is a prophetic word from an Old Testament prophet about what Jesus was going to do. And we've been reading about all of that reality this morning, just in Matthew chapter 23. In those scriptures, that prophetic word is actually being fulfilled. So the good shepherd laid down his life for us, yes. for you and me. And it's the good shepherd who calls you by name. Uh -huh. In other words, he's personal. It's a personal thing. Uh -huh. His voice is not rigid. It's not harsh. It's not controlling. Hey, you sinners! Get out here and pray. I mean, that's the way religious Christians do it. Yeah. You're going to bust hell wide open, you know? Yeah. That, that is not Jesus. No. He's calm. He's not rigid. He's not harsh. His voice is gentle. Mm -hmm. He's kind. And he's calming. Yes. The only time he's got a problem is with the religious hypocrites. And most of us have experienced what enemies of freedom can do. Right. And so have the unsaved. Yeah. It's time to get reacquainted with the one who came to set captives free. Yes. Not to give us more bondage, right. but to set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Yes. Amen? Amen? Isaiah 40 and verse 11. I'm going to go really fast this last one, which will be done. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. And we've probably heard this before, but I'll repeat it just because it is good. When it talks about the good shepherd, he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. The one sheep is straight. He's gone his own way. And everybody said, well, you know, you've got to repent. You've got to do this. Or repentance is just changing your mind. It's not, it's not like, you know, you go through this long, long, drawn-out grieving process. You just say, hey, this isn't working. Let's try this. That's repentance. That's what you're doing right now. Yeah. Every time we hear the word of God, repentance takes place because we start thinking about things differently, maybe, than we did before. That's, that's the true definition of repentance. It isn't, you know, falling somewhere and bawling and squalling and screaming and you know, it, you can do that, but that isn't really what repentance is. Repentance is just the act of changing your mind. Mm -hmm. So every time we hear something that changes our mind about God and the way we see God, that's repentance. God accepts that exactly for that reason. Yes. Amen. So when, when we think about these things, we've experienced how we can be manipulated and controlled. But the problem is captives can't set captives free. Right. You're in the same mess they're in. If you don't get free, you're not, you're not going to be any help to anybody else. So we've got churches that are all in bondage. Yes. Right. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not naming names or anything else. I'm just saying I've been there. I mean, I was in it. I'm just saying you, they don't set people free. They just give them a different cell. Yeah. Right. They just change the bondage. Yeah. Right. But it's still bondage. It's still guilt. It's still shame. It's still performance. It's still what I got to do. It's still, will God ever accept me? Will God love me? Amen? Romans 8 and verse 15. This God is a way better God than we've projected him to be, than we have presented him to be. And that's, that's a shame because we're supposed to be the body of Christ. If we're the body of Christ, we're supposed to be like Jesus was when he was here. He was a representation of God, the Father, showing people what the Father was really like, not what they had assumed that he was like based on their misconceived uh, thinking, but how God really was a God of love, how God really looked to give people uh, deliverance, how God really wanted to be a father to them. Amen? And here we are, the church, which is supposed to be the representation of Christ, and we're doing what the Jews did. We have missed it, right. and we're not entering in, and we're not letting them enter. Right. We're holding people out of the kingdom that God wants in the kingdom, yeah. that he died to be in the kingdom, to be a part of his family. Amen? Mm -hmm. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now last week there was a word given here, and uh, for me personally. And, and it was about, not, I mean, it wasn't for me personally, it wasn't like, hey, you know, this is for you. But it was spoken, and immediately I knew it was God trying to say something to me. Because I had some fears. I had some anxieties about some things. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. God was trying to say, it's, it's not coming from me. If you'll look to me, trust me, yeah. I'll take care of that. Because God didn't give us a spirit of fear. No. If you have fear, it ain't, it's not God. If you have anxieties about things, it's not God. It's your own lack of understanding about God, or it's the enemy trying to get you to dysfunction, to where you won't trust God because the, this thing that's coming up is just too big. Amen? Whether it's your retirement or lack thereof, or, or your finances, or your relationships, or your, you know, your health, whatever it might be, the enemy immediately comes in, the scripture says, to steal the word. So you get a word from God that says, by my stripes you're healed, and immediately the enemy comes to take that word and, gives you, and exaggerates your symptoms. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but my back, I'm healed, but what? You know. Well, at some point you have to say what God says or things don't change. Right. Amen? Yeah. It's the same as saying you are saved. Yeah. You are sanctified. And you say, but I look in the mirror, and I, and I see my life, and I know what I did yesterday, and I know what I did, you know, and I'm thinking about what I might do tomorrow. Yeah. And God's saying, are you going to believe me, or are you going to believe your own flesh? Right. See, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, yep. wicked, evil in high places, right. casting down imaginations. Right. Why? Because these things come to us, and unless we say something that's contrary to that, we're stuck with it. And it isn't just replacing one thought with another thought. It's replacing that thought with words. Yes. He's given us authority. Yes. And those words that we speak is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You all can have a vote about that. You can do whatever you want to do, but it's not going to change anything because God has already declared me to be the righteousness of God. You can say, well, I, you know, I know I heard about this or I saw that or I think you maybe. No, it doesn't matter. Whom, if God is for me, I don't care who's against me. doesn't matter what you think. doesn't matter what you say. God has already declared me innocent, righteous, holy, accepted. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's good news. Amen? So, to be free as believers, people have to realize that they are totally, 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 accepted yes. by God right. and totally acceptable yes. to God. Yeah. Not He isn't just accepting us and kind of like holding His nose. <laughs> he has made us acceptable. Yes. Yeah. He sees us perfect. Yes. He's not pretending like, you know, right. God, come on. No. He's looking right smack at us and saying, you're accepted yes. and you're acceptable. I'll have those. I'll have one of those. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Ephesians 1 6. See, we need to be free. We need to be happy. We need to have joy. We need to be up. How else are we going to reach other people? You cannot be going, oh my God. Come, why don't you come and see my Jesus? <laughs> Oh, yeah, please, take me with you. I mean, you've got to have something to offer. They, there's enough of the crap in the world. They don't need more. They, they need something that's going to give them some sense of relief and escape from that. Amen. And that's what Jesus came to give us. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Everybody say grace. grace. That's unmerited favor. That's what God has given us. Wherein? Praise the glory of his grace. Because of his grace, he has made us accepted in the beloved. Yes. Because he just did it. We didn't. He did it. And we are accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yes. 
and we are accepted totally because of God's grace in Christ. Yes. In Christ, we are perfect. We are righteous. We were crucified with Christ. Now we live. Paul says, but it's really not me living. It's me living, but it's not me living. It's Christ living in me. He does the work. The same thing Jesus said about the Father. He's done the work. He's made me acceptable. I, I don't have to because I couldn't if I wanted to. And God is saying, I'm not asking for that because I've already paid the price yes. so that I can accept you, so that you can be acceptable. Yes. Amen? Amen? That's what the world needs to know. Yes. Sadly, that's what the church needs to know. Yes. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Remember, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear but a power, love, and a sound mind. Right. Nope. Fear doesn't come from God. No. Because fear weakens us. Yes. Fear will make cowards of all of us. It's the truth. It, is. it makes us self-centered. Mm -hmm. It robs us of clear thinking. Spirit of fear, power, love, sound mind. I was talking to my brother the other day. He's trying to get me to come out and meet him somewhere between here and California. He's got a bunch of stuff going on in his life, and it's difficult for him, and he's trying to deal with it all. And for some reason, I don't think he thinks I can be of any help. He just wants, he just knows that we can laugh and think about other things maybe. But the point is, he wanted to buy me a plane ticket, round trip ticket. I said, Jim, I'm not flying. And he said, what do you mean you're not flying? You got a phobia about it? I said, yep. <laughs> you're afraid to fly? And I said, actually, I'm afraid to die. <laughs> flying doesn't bother me. It's if the plane crashes yeah. that worries me. Now, I know that sounds you know, like, well, come on, you're a Christian. I know. <laughs> I'm still not comfortable on an airplane. I used to. I flew all the time. Flew all the time in the service. I flew out. I, was out. I had jobs where I had to fly all the time. Last time we flew was to Tucson, Arizona, and that was, what, five, six years ago or something. And I caught her phobia. <laughs> it's a shame. But I've forgiven her, but, I mean, I still got it. I could fly if I really, really felt I had to, but I just don't like it. I, it's, I, it's not just the flying. It's all the junk you got to go through now, taking your shoes off and, you know, all the I'm just body cavity surges or something. You know, I don't know what's coming next, so I just don't really want to go through it all. But anyway, it's fear. Fear debilitates us. It, it, it stops us from being who we should be, and it stops God from doing what God wants to do. The only fear we should have is the fear of God. And that's not a fear like, oh, God, he's going to get me. It's the awe. That's the way it's actually translated. It's like, wow, he can do anything. Yeah. He's awesome. It's just yeah. incredible, the, the power that God has. That's what they're talking about. And that will overcome every other fear yes. that there is. Wow. Amen? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 8, 11 through 14. While he's bringing that up, Philippians 4.13 says, We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. There's nothing we can't do. There's things we'll choose not to do, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. Right. Amen? Because Christ gives us the ability to do it. Yep. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom the people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. Right. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear. Let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Israel. Let me kind of explain a little bit here, because what what's happening is, what we see a lot of times in a confederacy, just a, you know, a people grouping together. So like we just say like in a religious setting, churches come together. There's a lot of things being preached right now, and they are fear-based. I'm not saying there isn't truth in them. 
But unless they're given in the light that they should be given, all they do is create fear. And God said, let me be your fear. In other words, trust me. I'm greater than whatever this fear is that's being promoted. What's the end of the world? You know, uh, all this bad stuff's going to happen. We're going to starve to death. There's going to be mushroom clouds going everywhere. There's going to be locusts flying around the size of Volkswagens. And all this horrible stuff's going to happen because of the book of Revelation. I'm not saying there won't be situations and things that happen. I don't understand it all. But I'm just saying this. God is saying, don't be afraid of that. Don't be focused on those things. Focus on me. And I'll sanctify you. I'll set you apart. Amen? That's what he wants us to do. So I'm not against prophetic teaching. I'm just saying let's teach it in the way it's supposed to be taught Mm -hmm. so that Christ is magnified, so that our confidence will grow in him instead of our fear growing in all the situations that could, may, or may not happen. Amen? Amen. He'll be a sanctuary for us. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Because they're not trusting God. They're trusting in their own effort. They're trusting in their own performance. Praise the Lord. We can do all things, I said, because Jesus fulfilled all the commandments. Because Jesus fulfilled all the commandments, we have fulfilled all the commandments. Deuteronomy tells you what happens if you obey all of my commandments. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed coming in. You'll be blessed coming out. You'll be the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. You'll be healthy. You'll be whole. You'll be all of these things. And then he says, but if you don't, all of these sicknesses will come on you. Amen? You, you'll be broke. You'll be poor. The, the, your, your wells will dry up. All of these things will happen. Well, Jesus fulfilled all of the law. So I don't have to deal with dry wells, sickness, plague, disease, and all of this stuff. Because what I've got coming is the head and not the tail. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Blessed going in, blessed coming out. Above and not beneath. All of the things that he tells us we have if the law is kept. Jesus kept the law. And because I'm in Christ, God says, you kept the law. Because he kept the law, we kept the law. Amen? Hallelujah. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Say, why do you just keep going on about this stuff? Because... Faith comes by hearing the word. It comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. It doesn't come by hearing at one time and then going and listening to somebody else or some other teaching or some other uh, twist on it that tells you all of the negative stuff that's going to happen. Because I, I flip through the channel myself and I hear stuff and I go, oh my God, I don't want to hear it. It's not the truth. Only the truth sets us free. Only the truth truth makes us feel free. Only the truth makes us, when we leave here, feel like, man, you know, things are going to get better. Could be better. Instead of going somewhere where you think, oh, my God, it can't get any worse. I don't know what's going to happen next, you know. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Walking after the flesh is not, it's not believing God. Walking in the Spirit is simply believing God. It isn't floating around, you know, having visions and dreams and all that stuff. It could be that, but that's not what he's talking about. He's just saying we agree with what the Word of God says. Jesus said the words that I speak, they're spirit and they're life. So when we walk in the Spirit, we're walking in agreement with what his Word says. Not performance-wise, but based on what he's done, we have a right to expect God's favor. We have a right to expect blessing and forgiveness and mercy and grace. Amen? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, the flesh can't perform the law. It couldn't do it because we aren't able to keep it. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, in his flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the righteousness of the law has been perfected in me. In other words, as far as God's concerned, I have perfectly kept the law. I am perfect in Christ. The scripture even says, for those who have been perfected in Christ. Those are believers. That's just, that's who they are. Amen. Just believers. Praise God. All right. Hallelujah. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. We're just about done. 11, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. 
We, need to be the, we ought to be the happiest, the most positive. You know, I mean, happiness is something, but I'm talking about joy. I mean, just able to hang in there even when everything's not great. But we are, that, that's who we ought to be. Praise the Lord. If we really believe what the Scripture says. What have we got to fear? It's a win-win, you know. I mean, no matter what happens, like Paul said, to die, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Don't, bring, I, don't judge me about the plain thing. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He didn't say that he, there wasn't any yoke. He just said his yoke was easy. Mm -hmm. yep. Praise the Lord. The yoke of legalism is slavery. Yes. It's bondage. It brings spiritual exhaustion. Yes. I've been doing this long enough to know people will come. You can scare people to God with all the threats. But they won't live for God. They won't stay. They'll come out of fear. But as soon as that fear dissipates, they're gone. It was never God's intention to bring people. It's the love of God that draws people to change their mind, to repent. Amen? Amen. Jesus' yoke brings rest. And on the seventh day, he rested. And Jesus said the problem in, in Hebrews chapter 4, he says, the problem is they would not enter into my rest. And Paul says, don't make the same mistake. Having failed to enter into that rest, they wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years and yeah. died out there. Why? Because they wouldn't trust God right. that he had already defeated the enemy. Right. That it was okay. Everything was good between them and him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody needs freedom. Everybody. And it comes by the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. Read this one, then we got one more scripture and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. Yes. Spirit of freedom. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Yes. Now, try to mesh that in to most religious teaching. That where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right. Hit me again. I'm still hearing. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Oh, yeah. Amen. Don't be afraid of the spirit of God. Amen. It's the spirit of Jesus. Yes. They're one and the same. And they're sent forth into our heart, the scripture says, crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Father, Papa, Father. That's the way God looks at us. That's the way he wants us to respond to him. Back to David and Michael, where all this started. Only that spirit, the spirit of freedom. And produce fruit. It's the source of all fruit. Right. Why? Because the only fruit we're really interested in is the fruit that God's looking for. Right. And the fruit that he's looking for is our confidence and our faith and our trust in him because it releases him then to do whatever he wants to do. That's the big picture here that we're talking about. Yes. David, God showed it to us in one little story. David was all messed up, but he trusted God. And he was, he got free. Yes. He got loose. Amen? Amen. His wife mm -hmm. saw that freedom as stupid. Yes. That you should be mm -hmm. religious. You should be rigid. You should be yeah. under control. And she never produced any fruit. No. But let me tell you about the fruit David produced. Yeah. Yeah. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's the literal grace of God. Yes. Through his lineage comes Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. We'll quit with this. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life.
Praise the Lord. So I just say, I'll just end with this. Be like David. And dance like nobody's watching. Freedom was never meant to be hoarded. It meant to be heralded. So shout it. God's good. And he has set us free. So let's live like we're free. And dance like nobody's watching. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Go like you're free. Free like a wind. Praise the Lord. What? No happy? Don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord. Hi, baby.